Leanna, for those that haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. My name's Leanna Gant, and I'm the inventor of Tip Take Dosage Reminder Labels. We're going to talk about how I invented it and just the ups and downs of getting it out there into the world. Leanna, I like the word invention. We don't hear that too often. I've got a lot of pharmacists and people related to pharmacy on the show, and we have a lot of entrepreneurs and people that talk about their new business and that kind of stuff. But it's not too often that we get an inventor on the show. So that's great. Yeah, it's really exciting. And I think most people have really great ideas, right? Especially pharmacists, because they have so many patients with different problems Mm -hmm. and they have these great ideas how to help them. And taking all the steps to actually work it through and make the product's been a really exciting adventure. Ideas are a dime a dozen, but it's that moving through an idea and then actually making money off an idea. It is very uncommon in today's day and age for an idea to turn into a product, to turn into a profit. That doesn't happen a lot these days. It takes a combination of creativity and the tenacity to work through the market to actually sell something. So that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, I think sort of my disadvantage was my advantage is that when I started, I didn't really know what I was in for. Because I think if I knew how hard it would be, I wouldn't have started. (laughs) But once I've started and you're kind of like way steep in it, it's hard to just stop because you're like, I've gotten this far. Let's just see how far this will go. And I'm glad I've stuck it out. But Yeah. yeah, it's if I knew before, I probably wouldn't have would have been like, oh, no, that seems kind of scary. <laughs> All right. So, Leanna, in its simplest terms, give our listeners a crack at what this is. I've seen it. It's cool. What are we talking about here? Took Take, it's super simple, and it's a sticker. No, if you took it or still need to take it was sort of how we came up with that. And it's basically a sticker. We have four different varieties of it right now. So each different variety has different tabs on it that let you follow different dosing requirements. So we have a daily one that has tabs for the days of the week. And basically, when you take your dose, the sticker's right on the bottle. It lets everything stay in its original packaging with its directions and warnings, expiration dates, refill numbers. And it just goes right on the package. And when the patient takes their dose for the day, they just pull the little tab off and then they know if they took it or still need to take it. We have hourly, we have monthly, we have ones for up to 10 days for like antibiotics. But yeah, they're really simple and anyone can use them. And we found that because everything stays in the package and there's nothing to program, it's not complicated. We are appealing to a younger audience than most of the like pill organizers and things appeal to because People who just need to take a cholesterol medicine once a day, they don't want a whole system. They don't want to feel like it's taking over their life. All they want to know is if they took it. That, that's their whole question. And so we answered that question for them. I take some medicine and I have it in the old fashioned circular pill case. And I've got it on my phone as a reminder to take it. And then I've got that thing to let me know if I <laughs> took it. And I swear, if I did not look at it and see that days was empty, I would have no clue if I took it or not. It's kind of like driving to work and not realizing you Mm -hmm. went through the green lights kind of thing. Hopefully, maybe red lights. (laughs) Exactly. I think especially when something's routine, you do it every day. It's such a routine thing. You don't even really think about it, which can be dangerous if you're taking a prescription medication or if it's controlling your blood pressure. In my case, I take tamoxifen to help prevent my breast cancer from coming back. And it was really stressful if I wasn't sure if I took it, because if I take it twice, I don't feel well. But if I don't take it, then I'm like, will this be the day? Like, And I know it doesn't work like that logically, but you know, that it, you're like, well, how many times have I forgotten it? And yeah, now I just know that I haven't forgotten to take it, takes that completely out of the picture. And I can go on with my day and not have to wonder if I did it or if I do stop and go, wait, I don't remember doing that this morning. I can just look really quickly at the yes. bottle and be like, oh yeah, I did. Okay, cool. You almost want it as something that you f- just do naturally and just don't even think about, like brushing your teeth. It's like, I don't exactly. necessarily remember when I brushed my teeth this morning. I know I did, but then it stops because there's some things like brushing your teeth. If you do it three times in the morning because you're forgetful, well, big deal. But medicine is so important to take. You almost want to forget about it. But once you take it, 
it's as worse to take it double then. Exactly. And then, and we've had people say, because there's this little tab that you pull off, it's not like a button on your phone that you're used to hitting a hundred times a day. There's just enough sort of, of a process built in to pulling the tab off that it just makes it register in your head mm-hmm. that you did it. It's just because you have this little tactile, little tiny bit of resistance to, to make it memorable to you. Pharmacists, I think, who take medicine are probably the worst. I mean, I sometimes will bring Motrin home. And if it's for my wife and kids, I'll bring a bottle home. But if it's for me, I'll dig around the bottles and pull out heart medicine, a little bottle, and I'll go over and I'll put some Motrin in it and I'll cap it and I'll write ibuprofen on it. You know, it's ibuprofen on this heart medicine bottle. It makes no sense. I don't know about my other cohorts, but my medicine cabinet, it's like an (laughs) antique pharmacy show in there. I always feel bad for wives of people that are repair people because they do it all day and they don't want to come home and fix their drywall or this and that. I think we pharmacists are the worst. Leanna, going back then, you're tamoxifen. And so you're a breast cancer survivor. And that's where this sort of came together with all your medicines you take along with this daily one that you have to take still forever. Yeah. And I started making little labels when I was in treatment for breast cancer. And During chemo, I had literally 12 different things for side effects, and most of them weren't pills. I had like a mouthwash, and there was lotions, and there was ointments, and there was like all kinds of things and pills. And so like a pill box didn't work for two-thirds of the things because they weren't pills, Yeah, but they still had to be on a schedule. The doctors were still like, don't use this too much. It's a steroid. Don't do this. And, you know, I couldn't keep track of it. So I started to make little labels out of sticky notes. And that really helped for my family and myself to be able to know when I took things or used them. And it just alleviated a lot of stress for our whole family. Yeah. And then when I was done with treatment, I was like, okay, great. I don't need any of this stuff anymore. And I would just have this one pill. And within the first few weeks, I had probably half the time I couldn't remember if I took it. And that's how I found out I can't take it twice because then I don't feel well So because I took it twice. So I was like, hey, I think I need to make my little labels again. And I was like, I'm going to ask some of my friends, like people don't really talk about their medication that much, at least not my friend group. And I'm like, does anybody take anything every day? And every single one of my friends had something. I had someone who took something for a thyroid condition, someone who had a migraine medicine, and someone who took something for cholesterol. And I was like, well, how do you remember? And they had these weird little things. One person would feel in her sink in the morning because if her sink was wet, she knew she already took her medicine. There you go. Perfect. So I'm like, okay, I'm making these little labels and I just made some at home. I'm like, do you want to just try this and see if you like it? And they were all like, oh my gosh, this is so easy. This is what I need. I just need to know I took it. And that's when I was sort of like, aha, okay. Yes, it's great in extreme situations like chemo or a big medical treatment. When somebody really, they're drugged up, they shouldn't be trying to track their own medication. But there's an even bigger group of people who have things they take every day and they're doing a really crummy job of it and they want to do better. They know they should do better. They know there's going to be implications down the line if they don't take them every day, but they just didn't have a way to do it. And so it's been really great having people get like so excited over something so simple. Leanna, what kind of impact has this made? I know the product's out. Is this in hobby stage money? Is it a little part-time money? Is it a lot of money? How is this going for you? I would say we are still very much in the startup phase. It's going really well in that we're in some big pharmacy chains. We're distributed by Cardinal Health. So like we're getting into the independents, which the independents are amazing. Those are my people. And I think it's now that we're getting the people who sell things to know that we exist. Now our goal is to try and get the consumer to know we exist. Because right now we're still very word of mouth. My friend tries it, they tell another friend. It's a long process because we're not making the millions of dollars where we could run TV commercials or get celebrity endorsements or things like that. So it's we rely on people who like the product telling other people they like the product. Do you watch Shark Tank at all? I love Shark Tank. (laughs) I don't like Shark Tank because (laughs) let's say you went on Shark Tank, Uh Leanna, and they would say, great idea, Leanna. 
And you'd say, well, I'm in the biggest wholesaler. I'm here. I'm there. I would say, wow. The sharks are always like, how many sales do you have? And you'd have to say like a hundred million dollars. And they'd say, <laughs> eh, maybe we'll take it. It's almost like the people that go on there. It's not like an entrepreneurial show. It truly is like venture capital. It's not like that's a great idea. Because when I hear you're in these places, that's remarkable to me. Yeah, I find it to be very exciting. It's really exciting for me when people who have worked in the pharmacy business and our pharmacists are in different and ancillary things to pharmacy, see the product, I show them how it works, and they get it and they love it. Like, because I'm not a pharmacist. I have a degree from art school. I was an advertising creative director. So to come up with something and design something that's so appreciated by the community that works with the people I need to talk to, that's been huge for me. And I think in regards to Shark Tank, I think it is an investment show. They're looking at the bottom line more than the idea. So I think it is like if they see a way they can make money from it. But I still get excited by it because every so often they do still have the like small business like mine on there. And they just they take a flyer on it and are like, I just like you. I'm going to help you out. And maybe I'll be that person because I'm not the person who would give them one percent of my company for a million dollars. Like I'm not there yet. <laughs> so you're in Cardinal. People can go on there and actually look it up and buy it. How did that come about? I mean, I've got friends that have done stuff, even inventions on Amazon. I understand that part, but it seems like Cardinal, there's a bigger middleman, like just hard to get stuff into a wholesaler. How did that come about? It was a long journey. It was when I first launched the product, I just Again, not really knowing how it worked, I just went online and was like, I'm like, I want to sell to retailers, so I must need a distributor. And I just looked up who distributes medical supplies and Cardinal Health came up. So I went on to LinkedIn and started following people who worked at Cardinal Health. And then just the ones who connected with me, I just wrote and was like, hey, I have this invention. I am i don't know how I get into this. Would you mind helping me? And Somebody forwarded it to somebody else in Cardinal Health and they wrote to me and said, like, I looked at your website. You need to be in Cardinal Health. And like they just saw it. And then it was right before COVID. We were going to do a test with Cardinal Health and then COVID hit and everything shut down. The whole team we were working with got put on COVID related things and tests and all sent home. So then we didn't hear from them for about a year and a half. Wow. And the person who I'd been working with got moved to a complete other area of the company. And I was struggling. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get a hold of anybody. And then I wrote the original person and just said, hey, I lost everybody. Do you, can you point me the right direction? Because you were so enthusiastic. And he was amazing. He actually pulled together a whole meeting for me. And they... The new team looked at the product and were just like, yes, this is like the best change we've seen in adherence products ever. So let's get you onboarded, which I don't know if that's a typical story, but that was my story. I've talked to companies that have tried to get into the wholesalers, and at least one of them talked about the actual physical packaging. It was a mm -hmm. big product and this and that. You have a cool product all the way around because it's the stickers, if that's not derogatory, if I call no. them stickers. <laughs> so it's the stickers. And I see that you're able to offer, for example, on your site, you offer <laughs> free first class shipping. Well, it's probably 60 cents to a buck or something like that to send these out. I imagine a wholesaler, it's not a space commitment for them. It's simple all the way around. And I don't mean that in a derogatory term. I mean, it's so simple. It's cool. Yeah, no, I think that is an advantage for us. I think it's why we've had good luck because it isn't, we're not expensive for them to try out. We're not big. We're not hard to mail. We're very durable. We don't have an expiration date. So there's a lot of things in our favor for the retailers because we're just not really a high maintenance product. We don't take up a lot of shelf space. I think we also have an advantage because the compliance issues and like the, I think 
that technically our category is like aids to daily living. It's just not a huge area. There's not a lot of things in that area. So I think that's an advantage we have over like, I have friends who sell food products and their areas are so competitive and so hard to get in and the shelf space is like a premium thing. So I think we, I unknowingly lucked into some things just which is now I really appreciate that now that I sort of understand why certain things are easier for me than other companies. Shame on me for not asking about Shark Tank. Did you make that effort, Leanna? See, if I'm in somebody's shoes, I'd go on Shark Tank for the attention. But you alluded to this. I don't want to share my company, especially something like yours, Grassroots, that can grow pretty quickly without a ton of overhead. Is it just not the right spot for you? Have you at least considered it? I've considered it. I have applied every year since I started. and You I've, have. I have not gotten on. I know they get like tens of thousands of applications. Yeah. So it. I think part of it's luck. I don't know what they're looking for exactly. So yeah, I think I'll keep trying. My daughter doesn't want me to go on Shark Tank. She thinks they're mean. <laughs> she's like, mean. But she was like, I don't, she's like, you can't go on Shark Tank ever, mom, because they're mean. And I, it would make me so sad. And I'm like, oh, yeah. But, but. yeah. Well, Leanna, obviously one of the sharks is Mark Cuban okay. and he's got his new cost plus pharmacy now. And on the show, we've had the CEO of that and also the head of pharmacy on. Have you made that individual attempt at one shark versus all the sharks? I have been trying, just like with everything else, like I tend to just sort of send cold emails and messages through LinkedIn. I haven't gotten a response from anyone I've tried over there. I think we'd be a great companion because I think while he understands the need to get medications to people in an affordable way, right. I think the next step, and I don't know that they're there yet because they're still building up their list of medications and getting their company set up. Yeah. But I think the next step is then helping with compliance aids because then getting people the medication is the first step, making sure they take it and take it as they're supposed to is the next step. And I know all pharmacies have that trouble. They have someone who has a monthly prescription, but they only fill it nine times a year. So that means they're missing it a lot. And there's the cost implications to the pharmacy of that, of not getting the refills. And then there's the consequences to the patient for not really following the directions. Although somebody maybe could see through it and think a pharmacy was doing it for just their own business reasons, it's almost like proof that a pharmacy is trying to do something beyond selling. It's almost like we're going to hold your hand. We can't do it physically, so we'll do it through the next best thing. Yeah, like we'll be that sort of I always take sort of like that good friend that just gives you a little tap on the shoulder, like, hey, remember to take care of yourself. Like, remember to do this. We're not going to nag you, but we're there to just sort of remind you. I've had a conversation with some pharmacists that work in community pharmacies who say like, look, my patients struggle to come up with the $3 copay for their medication. They're not going to buy a $5 packet of labels. And I understand that. And I hope to someday be in a position where because I am selling them to people who do buy them, because most, most of our customers don't flinch at the $5 for a package of four labels. But I understand that. I know people who really do struggle to pay for their medication. And I hope to be able to give them to those people, give donate them to the pharmacy, because I'd love everybody to have access to Chick Take. But the reality is starting a business and especially after going through cancer treatment, like I, I need to make a living. And that's just sort of the reality of where we are now. But I see you give 3% to the cancer studies. Yeah. And we do donate to a lot of other groups that put together gift bags or care packages for different types of illnesses, breast cancer included, any cancer really. There's a handful of people who've written to me with very specific conditions. There's a family that has a child that takes a lot of medication and has a lot of caregivers and they find them helpful. So I send them to them. There's some people who have a permanent code for half off just they said they could, that was an affordable thing for them. So like, I try to do what I can. Right now, it's mostly like very individual because I, I don't want somebody who 
writes and says, this really does help me. Yeah. But I can't keep buying it to just not have it. That's, yeah. That, that I couldn't sleep if I did that. <laughs> you have to price it so you can be there two years or five years from now doing it. Whatever that price is, or else it's not going to help anybody. But let's say for a buck or two, a prescription or something mm-hmm. like that. If somebody looks at it and says, well, this medicine's only 32 cents. Why am I paying this? It's like, you're not multiplying that medicine. You're paying a couple bucks to not have a heart attack or so you don't go out of remission or something like that. It depends what side you're focusing it on. Right. Like our daily label, it you get four in a pack. If you take something once a day, that pack of four labels lasts you for two months. So that's if you break it down by the week, you know, that it's not very much. But then think about your copay for one visit to the urgent care, the ER, even your regular doctor. It's going to be more than five dollars. And a lot of those visits from talking to different physicians and nurses it is people either over or underdosing on their medication. But, you know, I understand the reality for people, especially right now. But I think there are enough people right now that can pay the five dollars. And I think it's fair. I think it allows me to stay in business. It helps pharmacies because, you know, pharmacies fill hundreds of prescriptions every day. If they can add a couple bucks onto every sale, it helps a pharmacy as well. And we've lost in my area a few independent pharmacies that I adored because they knew me. They knew my daughter. They like and they're gone. And I so like I really miss those pharmacies. And I know people all around the country really love their pharmacists. So want to help them stay in business too. We covered Cardinal. What other establishments are you in? We're also in CVS and in Walmart. Leanna, that's big. I never tried to put my podcast on the shelf there or whatever. Plus, I always talk bad about them. That's not going to go. That's not going to work. That's really big. Same method as you did with Cardinal? It was a little different. Walmart has a thing called Open Call USA which for U.S. made and manufactured products, which we are. We're made here in the U.S. Um, And I applied through there. And that helps because they pair you up with the buyer for your product. No kidding. Because finding the right category manager is really hard in the big retailers. So I did that for Walmart. CVS, I did a virtual trade show when I was like during COVID when I was just trying to kind of get things going. And someone from CVS happened to be on that. You were a virtual trade show, just like a pharmacy trade show might be. And there happened to be the buyer or somebody from CVS kind of going by your virtual booth. Right. They just... We, like the people got to like do a little video spiel and I did my little spiel and I talked about how great it is for all those liquid medicines for kids, because especially parents who have more than one kid and they get on different schedules to keep track of the all those liquid cold medicines. And the buyer happened to have a child who had a cold right then. So she related to the product so quickly and was like, we need this in CVS. That's interesting. So yeah, a lot of it is just, People can relate to the situation that took take helps. And it's just a simple thing. I know you're in California. You have mm-hmm. these printed in Colorado, and they're just sending then a box or boxes just to the distribution center when they need them or need more and so on. Yeah. I mean, we have a whole fulfillment system set up on our end with the company that's nearby where I live. I see. They're the fulfillment center, so they're getting the order and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I fill orders, smaller orders from our website, and we are with a few other like websites that sell for us. Sure. But yeah, like mostly the big orders all go through this fulfillment company because it's at a scale and the system's really complicated. On both ends. I imagine the computers have to sort of talk to each other, basically. Yeah, there's a system that we have to subscribe to and there's a whole bunch of parts and they each have their own way of doing things. It's no company works the same. And your distribution company does this for people like you, right? They're Mm -hmm. good at it. They don't do it just for you. No, they have a giant warehouse. They do it for a lot of, mine works mostly with small businesses in the area, but they've worked with all different like grocery stores and things like Macy's and then you know, all the drugstore chains. So yeah, that was really helpful because I didn't know how to do any of that on my own. 
We covered the bigger wholesaler. We covered the bigger stores. Amazon, you're on Amazon. We're on Amazon as well. I saw those earlier. I looked. Now, how about independent pharmacies? Are they going through Cardinal and you just have to let them know about it? Or how is that going with independents? That's what we're trying to do. We just joined Cardinal Health right before their big, what is it, RBC show. Yeah, right. This year. So we went to the trade show and we had literally just signed up with them and I'd ne never done a trade show in person before. So that was a crazy experience. So it was the first one I've ever done. And my husband and I did our booth. And I think because of COVID, we could go to a few pharmacies near us and talk to the owners and try and tell them about Tuk Take. But to really get to talk to that many pharmacists and see their reaction and answer their questions was really great. But after that, like, we didn't really know how to take orders at the show because we found out about it so late. We just didn't really know how it all worked. So yeah, I mean, now getting in touch with independent pharmacies, I've taken a lot of the approach of like the ones who I know are ordering, just saying it's like, hey, can you tell your friends about us? Because that's what we need is for them to be doing well with the product and then tell their friends so they'll order as well. It's really hard to reach all the independent pharmacies where the big chains like a CVS or a Walmart, in one sense, it's a one-stop shop because we have a buyer and that's who, and they take care of the locations. But those stores are actually a lot harder for us because we're down an aisle that people don't necessarily go down unless they're going to the pharmacy. Unless somebody's looking for a pill box, they're probably not going to stumble across us because that's where we're hanging. There's a lot of times the pharmacists don't even know we're in the store because they don't walk around seeing what new products are over there. So the bigger stores are actually much harder for us because the pharmacists usually are ordering for their own store. So they know it's in their store. They know how to, it helps people. They, if they have a mom picking up a liquid antibiotic, they could say, hey, you know what? You might want to give this a try. It'll help you keep track of this. It's kind of a necessary evil though, because until we got in the big stores, we didn't really have a lot of credibility with the independents. That's so interesting. We kind of... We've got to do everything, but I feel like eventually it'll settle in. And I feel like the independent pharmacies are really where we belong. It's just a matter of we can't call every independent pharmacy in the country. So, Do you get any pushback from a pharmacy? Like, I know it's hard to maybe get into them all, but do you get pushback at all? The only place I heard things was at actually at the trade show we were at. Some of our sample bottles were, I had just been collecting my own prescription bottles. So they actually had Walgreens caps, which we don't sell in Walgreens. But the independent pharmacists were like, oh, they're evil. How dare to show that bottle here? And I'm like, it's the only bottle I had. <laughs> so we went over to a guy that was selling like the blank bottles to the pharmacies, like all the vials and things. And I'm like, do you have any samples I could have? Because I'm getting like torn apart over here from my Walgreens cap. And so like they gave us some new lids to put on our bottle. We would have salespeople come to the store and my dad, God rest his soul, but the salespeople would come in and my dad liked to tease them and he got pretty tough on them sometime. And they would say, Jim, we're only focusing on independence with this. And my dad would always turn to me and say, well, that's because the chains don't want them. <laughs> because if anybody could, you'd want to be in every chain. You want to be everywhere. So in my opinion, you could go to an independent and let's say for some reason, the chains, you weren't in the chains, you could go and say that to them. But I'm not big on that because I think it, shouts that a little bit, like we're kind of small. We couldn't make it there, so we're doing it here. So I think preach it loud and proud that you're everywhere. Yeah, and I think as a business, like my goal is to be everywhere that people buy wellness products. And it's like, I don't judge if someone wants to use Chinese herbs versus prescription medications. I don't have a favorite health plan or wellness plan. I'm not pushing any particular brand or type of medication or a way to take care of yourself. I just know that if you do things regularly and build up a healthy routine, whatever that may be, it'll work better. And if you've invested in $300 in Chinese herbs, you're still not going to know if they're helping you if you don't yep. use them the way you're supposed to. For sure. And to do that, we need to be everywhere people are. 
So if somebody's at a grocery store, great. If someone's at CVS, great. If yeah. they're at their local pharmacy, like we want to be available for people to help take better care of themselves. I'm not picking a side. I just want to be everywhere. What has your biggest headache been so far? Let me ask it another way. <laughs> What's your biggest lesson so far? I think it was actually at the very beginning of Took Take. Like I waited and redid my website and was like, this has to be perfect. And I have to have envelope. I have to be all ready because I'm going to hit go on this website and I'm going to just run out of product. I And we had a lot of product, let me tell you. And because I'm like, we're, it's just going to, we're going to sell millions in a day. Okay. It's not Field of Dreams. If you yeah. build it, they don't come. <laughs> Nobody, we got zero vis visitors. I think like the visitor we got was my mom. Didn't buy anything, by the way. She's just like, oh, that's cute, honey. Like she didn't even buy something. Oh my gosh. So I think that would be the thing. It's like, it's a lot of work. Like I still am trying to shout from the rooftops like, hey, look at Took Take, look at what we do. I think that's the fallacy. You hear it all the time of people saying, look, there's... 300 million people in the U.S. and take 10% of those who do this and that and then take only 1% that do that and then take only 1% that do this. So that means you're going to get, you know, 3,000 orders the first day. It's like it just doesn't work that way. The percentages, it's the physics of like a bouncing ball. Like it only bounces halfway, then halfway, then halfway, then halfway. And you're saying, see, it never actually touches the ground in the end because it's always just halfway closer. It's like, no. <laughs> It made it. It's just not working. In theory, that's right, but it's just not working. Exactly. Like, because I mean, I can spout out all kinds of statistics that you probably already know, but it's like 70% of Americans take at least one prescription medication a year. 50% of those aren't taken correctly. What does that mean for me? It means there's still a lot of people who don't know I exist. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that we're selling millions a day. It just means I have a lot of people to try and find out how to talk to. <laughs> yeah, right. I imagine on your label, you have some space. I know you've got the days and the times. I'm not saying you should have. Have you thought of putting, you know, Chinese fortunes on them or advertising or something? I know at the pharmacy, we get these companies once in a while that want to advertise. They want us to use prescription bags at like the local people have paid for the advertising and I don't do it. I don't want someone's muffler company on my prescription bag. I think it's gaudy. But I imagine you have some space on yours. Have you thought about mixing that somehow? Not really in that way. We're in talks with a large research hospital. And if we work with them, they wanted us to, instead of having the Took Take logo, have their logo. So we're going to do like a private label version. For them, it's more for a clinical trial scenario. So we're in the process of talking with them. I think we'd prefer to do that and find a cost-effective way for pharmacies to put like their name and phone number, their name and website on it. So when people are done, they're reminded what their pharmacy, that their pharmacy provided these or that they purchased them there. Right now, our cost, because we're still small, our cost to do private label, like they have to be like a hospital size order to work. But yeah, I think like I had ideas like if we get really big, we could do superhero ones for kids medicines and we could do fun sayings or different colors. Right now, we're still sticking with what we, we just the basics. And <laughs> I always question that at the pharmacy. It's like, I mean, our bottles already have our labels on. And so mm -hmm. you always question whether people are trying to sell you bottle caps and the bags and this imprinted here and there. It's like, if you can't look at your bottle that you're touching every day and seeing where you went, how valuable is the bag you're going to throw away or the receipt you're going to throw away, that kind of stuff. So I question the value of having your name plastered on everything. I agree, because I also think like people kind of know where they got their prescription for. <laughs> like, I mean, most people have a pharmacy they go to, even whether it's a big chain one or an independent local pharmacy, they go to the same one. They're not wondering where the heck they got their medicine from. Right. So, so yeah, I think we're just trying to keep everything really simple. I I think that's the beauty of Tuk Take. I have people ask, like, are you going to make an app that's a companion to it? No. 
the whole point is, if you want to set an alarm on your phone, great. But uh, we're a great companion to an alarm because the alarm might remind you, but you still won't know if you did it or not two minutes That's later. That's what I did. My alarm went off for my day when I went over there and I couldn't believe they were gone. So obviously I took them, but I had no remembrance. My husband does that all the time. And he was actually the last person in our house to, to use to take because he was, I remember my Medicare. Sure. I have a system and he had his whole little routine every morning. And then one morning he didn't like it. And it threw him off for like days because he was so flustered, not knowing if he had forgotten it. But like my daughter uses them. We used them for our dog's medicine. We <laughs> like he was the last one. And now he's he's all about to take. <laughs> Leanna, if somebody came to you and said, you're going to win whatever prize if you grow really quickly, like overnight, do this and that. If money wasn't really an object, which of course it is, if it wasn't an object, you'd have Super Bowl ads, you know, and it'd be a waste of money, but it would hit people. If money wasn't an object, what would you do to have this like blow up overnight? I think more advertising, but I think also more samples. I think if we could get every pharmacy to give out a sample that was, if it's an hourly medication, like the appropriate label for the sample to everyone. I think people would try it. They would like it. And not everyone. We're not for everybody. But the people who it helps would know it immediately. And then I think they'd be fans forever. Trying it is the way that people are like, oh, yeah, that worked. That helped me. I'm good. That We're not a hard sell thing. Some of these companies, the pharmacists will buy them and then the pharmacists will do it and either lose money or up the price a little bit. I'm thinking of things like flavoring. I'm thinking of mm -hmm. stoppers and bottles and just things that pharmacists do. Do you, I'm not saying you should, and I don't think I would even want to do it, but has that ever crossed your mind of saying, let's have the pharmacist apply these for Mrs. Smith because she likes them and then she'll go to your pharmacy because you do that on her bottles or will it always be the consumer or the caregiver who's applying those in your head? I think it'll always be the consumer. One, I think pharmacists have enough to do already. I think for them, it gets into issues that I don't even understand, but with covering things or you know, I think there's all kinds of liability for them to do it. So I think it'll always be the customer. In a way, it's double directions, like the pharmacist does that, and then they're putting a different label on it. And what if one says twice a day and the other one's morning and mid-afternoon, whatever. Yeah, or it's just somebody, they have to educate them on how to use yet another thing. Because like I said, Tick Take isn't for everyone. I yep. think it really does skew younger. We have a lot of families who have kids who take things for ADHD or anxiety, and they're using them to help their kids become responsible before they go off to college. But it gives the parents a way to kind of check in on the prescription by checking if the tabs have been pulled off or not. But they don't have to nag and hover and keep asking. They could just kind of look and see if their child is becoming more responsible or kids who are off in college. It gives them a way when their schedules are changing a lot. But I think it's just it's a very different audience than I think at least from what I've been told, that pharmacists are used to talking about compliance in this way because they're used to thinking of their older patients, that maybe their noncompliance has more to do with memory issues. Remembering to even do it. And your thing right. is you have to at least remember to go to the bottle where the elderly might not even do that unless you light a fire underneath them. But with the younger generation, they actually forgot if they did it or not. Yeah. Or there's even busy parents taking their blood pressure medication. Like your day, you think your day is exactly the same every day, but it's probably not. Things are different. The phone rings. You picked up your bottle, the phone rang, you put it down. Somebody said something, you dropped something. I think for younger people, they also, a lot of people I know keep throw their medicine in their purse because they take it when they get to work or they- right. But I think there's so many different things. They don't have a set system. And for like some people I know who still use pillboxes who are older, it's also like they actually need them, the pills separated out. 
And that helps them keep from taking it too often, where otherwise they'll go to the bottle three times and then they're not going to remember to take the tab off. So I think that's been a thing for us is just also educating pharmacists that and caregivers that this isn't ideal for the elderly unless it's being used by a caregiver. It's for everyone else who doesn't have anything, who doesn't want a pill box and or who doesn't have a pill for medication, who has gummies or has liquids, lotions, drops, insulin. We've had people use them on inhalers. And a lot of those things like inhalers are people carry them around with them. So it needs to, we try to make them sticky enough that they won't come off or get pulled off accidentally, but not so sticky that you can't get the, it off of the thing. <laughs> you mentioned different things that people have. Honey bunches of oats. That's my drug of choice. And I can see my wife putting one of these on there and she'll take one off. I said, Mike, you've already had your bowl tonight. And it's like, I know, but I'm nervous. <laughs> I want four bowls tonight. <laughs> Lay off me. There's people I know who use it on their like protein powder or their collagen powder. And it's not so much that they think they'll forget to put it in, but it's to they want to keep track and say, I spent 30 bucks on this protein powder. I want to see if it's if I feel any different at the end of the bottle, but they need to do it every day. So it lets them make sure they're doing it every day. There's checklists on phones and so on. And mm -hmm. sometimes they'll give you the option. They'll say, don't make this task I did disappear, just cross it out because I want the satisfaction of seeing it to know that I did it. And you could look at your stuff psychologically almost and say, well, what does an empty bottle give you? But if somebody who's proud of the fact that they're compliant, maybe it's muscle stuff or protein that they can kind of look at it and say, they're all gone. Look what I did. But there's my gold star there still with the remainder of the took take things. But the medicine's gone. Yeah, I think it it does let you know, like there's all kinds of psychology about people with forming streaks. Like they talk about it a lot on. Exactly. With the uh, like things that are gamified because it's like you you want to check the box. You want to keep the streak going. What's the other one? Snapchat. They have the streaks. My kids won't even do streaks with me. I send them <laughs> one. They're like, stop it. I said, I just sent you one. <laughs> exactly. It's like there's something in us that like, like I'm a list person, but yeah. my favorite part of making lists is the crossing the thing off the list and having the things like, exactly. I did it. And this gives me that same feeling. And I think, as I say, like even like for like lotions, if you've ever had your kids like go to a dermatologist, you know how much those use this lotion for your acne. It's ninety dollars, and then you know, like my daughter would be like, "Yeah, this isn't working." I'm like, "Okay, are you using it twice a day?" Like she said, she's like, "Well, sort of." I'm like, "No, not sort of. That was ninety dollars. Let's see if it works. Because if it doesn't work, before we go to the next hundred dollar thing, let's see if you use this like you're supposed to." And lo and behold. When she used it like she was supposed to, the world was a happy place. <laughs> You're exactly right. I don't go to many of the appointments with my kids, but when I do in the past, the doctor would be like, how's this working? It's like, I don't know. I mean, in theory, it's not working because in theory, he or she takes it, but I don't think they do. So I don't really have an answer for you. Exactly. It's like the same thing with allergy medication. It's like a lot of them, they take a while to, to build. It's not like take this. It's not like Benadryl where you take it and it like works right away and be like, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. And it's like, well, are, you can't be taking it because there's half a bottle and we've had it for a month. It's like, well, this because it doesn't work. I'm like, no, you, need, you can't take it every third day. You have to take it every day. <laughs> Leanna. Three years from now, you've done sort of what you want to do. You've licensed the product and you have all the different NFL teams on it and all that kind of stuff. And you're making these in different shapes for the different audiences and stuff. But it's going so well in three years, you're bored with it. But you're not going to tarnish the brand by doing an app or online something and that stuff. Let's say it's just as successful as in your wildest dreams, what would you do in three years? I mean, I think at that point, hopefully one of the larger companies would be interested in maybe and buy the patent and buy the product from me. I mean, I didn't set out to invent a product, let alone like really like dive into medication adherence and medication management. Like 
learn all of this. It, it wasn't like I had this burning passion to solve <laughs> adherence issues. It just came from my own need. And so, yeah, I mean, I think I love my company. I love my product. I want to stick with it for a long time. But I also really just want the product to exist out there to help people. So I mean, it's not something that I feel I have to cling to. I mean, I think the other thing that led me to start this too is having cancer is expensive. It wiped us out pretty good. So like it's trying to get my first goal is to like get my family back on its feet. I couldn't work for over a year. My husband was taking care of me. We had a design business we did together. So like he couldn't do as much. So, like, it was a whole thing and it's been great. And I, I definitely love it and I'm still excited by it. But yeah, I'm open to doing something else someday. Most people, when they think of someone getting financially hit with a serious disease, the first thing that comes to me is, well, their insurance covered this. That's part. But like you said, there's jobs that go by the wayside and there's maybe home things that go by the wayside or have to be built up. There's a million things outside of just the insurance, I imagine. Definitely. I think a lot of people don't consider the fact like some people, everyone's cancer treatment's different. Everyone's yeah. experience is different. I didn't have the kind where I was really inspiring to others and out running a marathon or doing anything like that. I was out. I was in bed for six months. I was ill. I there was even if I wanted to work, I could there it wasn't even getting close to happening. And so it was a lot of work for my husband and my daughter was still in high school at the time. And so I mean, it was just, yeah, there's all the other things because life goes on and you don't get to just say like, hey, by the way, we were basically freelancing. We, we worked for ourselves. We had our design business. You don't get to just tell people, it's like, hey, can you just pay us even though we're not working for you? It's like, <laughs> if we don't work, we don't get paid. And our insurance was fine. It was it worked out better than I thought it would, but we had to pay for a way to live for over a year. So most people aren't prepared for that, at least That's not right. that I know. Well, you were too sick to be encouraging. I always thought, I don't know why the hell I thought this, but I thought when I was younger, like if I get cancer, I'm going to be the most encouraging, happiest guy to the nurses and all that kind of stuff. I've never even been in the hospital. I mean, my wife's been in for babies. I've never spent a night in the hospital for my own stuff. I know after like eight hours in there, I would be the orneriest <laughs> old fart in the place. I'd be cussing and getting that bell and dinging and things. I'd be a terrible patient. It, it would just drive me batty. And so congratulations, Leanna, for coming as you have, because that's got to just be a terrible thing, a terrible burden. Yeah, I mean, I had never been in the hospital except to have my daughter. I had never had a surgery. I think they found me very amusing because I asked really absurd questions, apparently. They have this thing when you go in that they ask you why you're there, like when they're checking you in before yeah. they do surgery. Yeah. And I found that question horrifying. I'm like, well, why, don't you know why I'm here? Yeah, you're the surgeon. Exactly. Like, <laughs> That's not a good sign. They would laugh and I'm like, no, seriously, don't you know why I'm here? Because yeah. I, if you don't know why I'm here, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It was quite an unexpected experience, but I won't go so far as to say like it was meant to be because now I have a business because I think that's strange. But I think I was able to take something that was unpleasant and I found something good out of it. I'm not going to say it was meant to be because I... I think a lot of things are meant to be, but I don't think I was meant to get cancer so I could invent a sticker. If you think back over that time, what's your biggest emotion? If you put yourself right in the middle of that. Mostly frustration because I did want to do things. I wanted to get up and work. I wanted to spend time with my family. I wanted like there was a lot of things I wanted to do and I physically just couldn't do it. It wasn't like I was just tired, like I physically couldn't stand up and it. I love my oncologist because he saved me, but he knocked me on my butt. He told me, like, that's what I'm going to do. And you're not going to be out doing all these things you keep telling me you're doing. So I'm like, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to Disneyland and I'm going to take my daughter shopping for a prom dress. And they're like, no, you are not. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> but it all turned out well. 
I always tell my wife, I say, if something happens to me, don't ever use that line as you were alluding to, Leanna. Like, don't ever use the line like, well, if we can save one person, if only one person doesn't do this because of what happened to Mike, I'm like, not one person. I said, you can trade my lesson for like 10 people. Like if 10 people don't die because of this stupid thing that Mike did, great. But this one for one. Yeah. Why would you do one for one with a stranger? Yeah, I think like I'm glad I got something good out of the experience. But, you know, like I said, it's I don't think it it was meant to be this way. You made the lemonade out of the lemons, but you didn't go searching for exactly. to be a lemonade maker. Yeah, I wasn't like, let's find some tragedy that I could inspire myself to invent something. Like, yeah. it, I think it it happens that it was something I used during my treatment. I think it yeah. could have just as easily been a toy if I had thought of a toy. Like it, it was just, this really helped me. And I thought, Like I said, like when I was done, I was like, hey, this can help me and my friends and their kids and so many people I know. And now that I've realized I can help people, that's a really exciting feeling at being able to help this many people just just stay healthy. I'm not curing a serious disease. I'm just trying to help people take care of themselves. And if they can do it with this, that's great. Tell me about your patent. Was that something that was hard to get? Was that something that you needed? And is it something that you think will work if some other country slash punk online just decides (laughs) to make up stuff? I talked to a friend of mine about the product when I was starting who happened to be a lawyer. And I was like, just said like, hey, I looked into patents. I bought a book, like do-it-yourself patent. Do you think this is worth doing? And he explained the pros and cons of it and connected me with a friend of his who was a patent attorney. And I talked to her. And at first she said, she basically said, let me do a little looking around. They are very expensive to do properly. You shouldn't do it yourself. I know people who have, and they've done it successfully. She said, if I can do some searches and give you some advice and tell you if it's worth doing and if we can write a patent that's protectable. And she's like, I think I'm going to find a bunch of things like this. So I'm probably going to tell you no. Because there's already things that are close and so you don't stand out enough to make a patent for it. Yeah. Or my patent would be so narrow that it would be really easy to work around. I got you. Sure. So, yeah, she called a few weeks later, emailed me, and she was just like, I stand corrected. I can't find anything. So she's like, we can have some fun here. We can write a really strong patent for you. So we have a really strong patent. It actually also, for being such a simple product, is surprisingly hard to make. And that's where my husband and I being designers came in handy because Well, we didn't know it was going to be so hard to make. We understood what the problems the printers were having were and were able to address some of them and modify design a little bit to make it work. So it wouldn't be impossible for someone to copy it. It would be more work than I think people think when they first see it. Sure. And it's a lot of expense to get set up. So I don't know that someone would bother trying to to do it. And if they did, we do... I've been told by several people who have actually looked at the patent that we have a really strong patent, which also makes it desirable later on if someone wants to acquire it because we did the heavy lifting up front. My friend owns a tool and die business. It wasn't automotive. And now he's done some cool things with both hummingbird feeders out of plastic. And then also he does these hangers for some of the machines. Like when you do yard work, I mean, I don't, but I've seen people do it (laughs) on my window. Like my wife, hey, you missed a spot over there. But they've got all the attachments. It's one unit, but they've got an edger and a clippers and a brush and all that kind of stuff. And these attachments are like four feet long. Those don't have a real good way to hang because they're just like a pole. And so he makes these plastic things that go down and kind of catch it by twisting and he hangs them up. And he's on Amazon and things like that. He and I have talked about patents and his goal now, he knows that if somebody broke the patent and like I say, some other country or some punk that's just making these things up, 
But the reason he gets the patent is so he can then mail this to Amazon and say, look, I wish you wouldn't sell that because I've got a patent on that. Mm -hmm. And then he's had Amazon not sell things. So he's not going to the person, the country or the punk that's doing this and trying to stop them or get something from them because they're just going to skirt around. And you could do that Mm -hmm. as well with Amazon and Walmart and see that say, look, you don't want to go there. Right. Yeah. I think that's the other thing on Amazon. I think they call it brand registry Mm. where it gives you and we have that where it gives you the tools basically to report if someone's selling a fake version of your product. And it probably helps then with the background and the stuff you have. The more you have, the better to stamp your approval on it. Yeah, or like, disapproval. You know, trademarks, patents. It. I worked with people to get those things. That's not my area of expertise, but I've found really smart people. I think yeah. growing up in LA, I know a lot of lawyers. Yeah, the side benefits of being in Los Angeles. But yeah, I think I've let people who are better at that take care of those things for me, and I think they've done a very good job. That's why I think it, when someone has an idea, like you said back at the beginning, it's a lot of people have ideas, the path to getting it out there and then getting it to be something that everybody knows and everybody uses is a very long journey. And there's yep. so many different parts of it. And I think for me, since we weren't like millionaires before who could just start this company and hire all these different people, you have to become an expert in so many different areas. It's a huge learning curve. But I like learning these things, so it's been really fun for me. I'm excited about the journey. And another friend of mine who has a product, she was reading some books about different companies. And she said, most of the companies that we think of as overnight successes that like, for sure. it's like, wow, this product, all of a sudden it's everywhere I look. They took seven, eight, 10, 12 years to become an overnight success. So that's sort of my plan. It's like, I am I know that- For sure. It'll happen, and but it's not, goes back to the story about the website. It's not, if you build it, they will come. It's, it's going to be a 10-year journey before people are like, oh yeah, tick, tick. Nowadays, with the, I say nowadays with the internet, you know, like it just came out like, <laughs> I'm an old fart. Like it came out two years ago. I mean, for you guys, it's like, it's been there since waters existed. But it used to be when you had an idea for something or for a business, you either built the business by brick or you built the product and hoped that it would sell, wrote the book, had it printed, hoping it would fly off the shelves. Nowadays, and this is something that I first read about, or he jogged it in my mind, Tim Ferriss from the four hour work week. Mm-hmm. But now there's so many things you can do online to test stuff. Like if I had an idea like this now, I could buy some Google ads, maybe pay 20 bucks for a Google A and B ad. But on one of them, I would say, here's this product, click on it. The other one, I would say the same thing, but one would go to talking about a product for senior citizens, and one would go to mothers of children who needed medicine. And it would cost you like 20 to $50. And like a week later, you'd say, oh, this one got 80% of the hits and this one got 20%. And that's your market research. And it's just amazing. And even for free, throwing it on LinkedIn or Facebook or something and getting feedback, it's like, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to turn into sales, but it's a lot of feedback you can have in a really cool, quick, cheap way these days for ideas. It is. I think, you know, there's also, there's so many different groups that like for entrepreneurs or inventors Mm -hmm. or parents, and so many of them are so receptive as long as like I'm transparent about it. Like if it's a mom's group on Facebook or something, if I say, hey, here's what I, here's who I am, here's what I did, would it be possible to put this up there and see if anybody wants to try samples of my product and give me some feedback. And some will say, no, we don't do stuff like that. And some say yes. And I think the biggest thing I've learned through this whole project or process of starting a business is just don't be afraid to ask. Like if I have a question, I go into different groups. I go on LinkedIn, I go on Instagram and I just put it out there. Sometimes I get answers, sometimes I don't. Yep. More times than not, I do. And it's always so helpful. And it's like these resources are there. You don't have to pay tens of thousands of dollars for focus groups. Like 
you yeah. used to have to. You could really just say, hey, I'm looking for 30 people to try a new product and tell me what you think. Only requirements are you need to take a daily prenatal vitamin and, you know, and I'll send you free product. And people write in and say, yeah, I'd like to do that. <laughs> Leanna, let's say took take is no longer a part of you. Either you sold it or it's just steadied off and it doesn't need a lot more work, whatever the reason. Is it in your blood now, the entrepreneurial ship? Would you go back to your design company or is a product in a national thing in your blood that you think you would start something else? I think I would start something else. I don't think it would be a product. My family and I talk about this a lot. Like, what would we do if if I wasn't doing took take? And so we have some ideas, but they're more going back to sort of art and design. And But I think I've learned so much doing this business. And I think I'll continue to learn a lot more over the next five or 10 years with that, that I think will apply to any business. I think they're not just specific to a product. Because I think if I had a service, it would still be a very similar process. It's about finding how to talk to the people who need what I have and the best ways to get it to them. You know, boy, it's cool stuff. I think pharmacists, have the idea to say, ah, I should invent that or something like that. So I think it's just fascinating to see how you took it from the beginning and got there. So way to go. We'll be watching, continue what you're doing. And I wish you a ton of success with that. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me tell more people about Tuk Take. It, it takes a village to get a product out there. <laughs> <laughs> it sure does. All right, Leanna, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.